All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this special genealogy presentation on the history of the Twin Lakes, Schaefer and Freeman. Our presenter is local author Bill Madden. He has published many books, including The Indiana Beach, A Fun-Filled History. We have Monticello, The Old Monticello Cemetery, and then the history of Monticello. And of course, there's several others that we have here at the library that you can come and borrow. Um, Bill is also the publisher of Monticello Magazine. Um, so he is here with us this evening to talk about his newly released book, and it's the history of the Twin Lakes, Schaefer and Freeman. And so he's gonna share some images and then discuss some of the history that he's researched about it, about both the lakes. So I am going to let now Bill take it over. Thank you, Candice. I appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> I was going to uh, talk about a little bit, of, give kind of a little bit of a preview of, uh, of the book. I started uh, working on it a couple of years ago and uh, then it got interrupted and I ended up uh, doing a history book on the uh, American Legion Post 81 because they were celebrating their 100th anniversary. So I just kind of put that book off. Uh, that book was published last year. And then, and then uh, the, you know, if anything, the pandemic helped me finish this book and it was done uh, in, in May. Uh, and I had really had hoped to get it out by the June festival, but you know what happened to the June festival? It got canceled. So uh, we didn't have a June festival, but it was uh, put out in May. And then, and then I started uh, marketing on Facebook because that was the only place I could really uh, market the book. Uh, uh, there was social media. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, how the lakes were formed. Uh, here's a, here's the cover of the book. I guess you can see that, huh, Candace? So this is the cover of the book and uh, it has a lot of uh, vintage postcards that I used for the cover of the book. And uh, a lot of those are inside the book as well. Um, but let me talk a little bit about um, how uh, the, the, the lakes were formed. Uh, it was actually um, started with, um, <clears throat> with uh, the Tippecanoe River. That's how they, they, were, they came from the uh, Tippecanoe River. And, um, oh, here's the cover of the book now you can see. <laughs> it was the, uh, uh, the, and the river was actually formed during the Ice Age. Um, as you might recall, we, Indiana was in a, a large Ice Age many, many thousands of years ago. And, and it created lakes and, and then it created the river as well. And uh, so, but then about the, about the early 1900s, uh, you know, there was dams, larger dams were being built. I mean, uh, there was already a small dam that was uh, providing electrical power to Monticello, but they wanted to build larger dams to provide more electrical uh, power to all uh, the other cities uh, in, in the area. And they decided that uh, dams was, was the best way to do it. And in this area, they decided that uh, four, four dams should be built. Uh, one was uh, uh, going to be built in Norway. And then the next one would be done in Tioga area and then Oakdale and then Springboro. So they decided, okay, Norway would be first. So, uh, and, and so the, you know, in the 1920s, early 1920s, they of course uh, had to buy property from farmers and stuff because when the dam was built, then a lake would form behind it, or like a reservoir, it would form behind it and they would uh, occupy, that lake would occupy the land that farmers had. So, or if they had buildings on there, those buildings had to be moved. Bridges had to be built because uh, then you'd be able to cross the, the lake or the rivers. Uh, so, you know, 
a lot of planning had to had to be done and it took a couple of years of planning and then construction began in 1922 and it took uh, like about a year over a year to uh, build Norway Dam and this is a photograph of the uh, of course there it was called the Indiana Hydroelectric Power Company who owned the uh, who built that particular dam the, and they call it the Norway plant but, aka Norway Dam um, after that was completed then they we uh, we're moving on to whoops I'm gonna go, things going along here I want I just want to show the Norway okay <laughs> I guess it went crazy on me anyways uh, then next was to build um, Oakdale Dam and uh, that began pretty much uh, right after Norway Dam was completed and that took uh, over a year to build and in June 1925 uh, Oakdale Dam was created. This is a construction photo of the dam and you can see uh, it was uh, the equipment they used back then was uh, a little bit uh, archaic in, in our standards nowadays, but they got the job done. And, and uh, as you can see, they had uh, horses, uh, people on horses and wagons and everything. And this is from, uh, from an old postcard. And uh, they completed, after they completed uh, Norway Dam, they had uh, the lake and they called it uh, Freeman Lake. Uh, let me back up a second. Schaefer Lake, of course, was formed right after the Norway Dam was completed. And it was named after John A. Schaefer, who was the engineer in charge of creating the uh, Norway Dam. And so they, after they finished uh, the Oakdale Dam, uh, they called it uh, Freeman Lake after Roger M. Freeman, who was the engineer who, uh, of the Oakdale Dam. Although there was some people that thought that it should be called uh, Lake Delphi or a sign went up actually in October and, and uh, it was called, uh, the sign said Lake Tioga. You know, so some people thought it should be called Lake Tioga. So uh, there was some uh, controversy as far as, as the naming of it, of, of it goes, but it became Freeman Lake. Uh, of course, Schaefer Lake being first, it was the first to be developed. And it was developed quite quickly. Um, uh, several developers, uh, uh, one was uh, uh, former Mayor O'Connor. Uh, he was a realtor and uh, he created a development and a guy by the name of Earl Spackman uh, bought some property there and uh, created a, a, a cottage there for his summer use. And when he was there, some people would come up to him and say, hey, is there any place to swim around here? And uh, unfortunately, there wasn't really any place to swim. You gotta remember that they filled in some farmland. So you're talking about uh, mud underneath or, or maybe some stone and mud. And uh, so it, that gave him the idea to create a swimming place and he got he was working for the ideal furnace company at the time and, and asked them if they would be interested in in backing him giving him some money so he could buy some more lake property and uh, create this uh this swimming place and they said fine and he he uh, would call it ideal beach and on june 16th 1926 he opened the swimming place on uh called Ideal Beach. And it just had a concession stand and place to change. And, and that was it. It was just basically a, basically a swimming beach. Uh, the following year, he actually sold it to somebody else. And that person uh, brought in the, uh, the first ride, you might say, a first amusement ride. And, and that was a, a, a kind of a slide thing that went down. And it was called the toboggan. And the toboggan slid down and, and threw people into the lake. And, uh, and, but they, you know, he only held on to it for a year. They sold it back to Spackman. And then uh, a couple of years later, uh, Spackman went ahead and, and uh, built a casino and kind of went from there. And that was like in the 1930s. The one thing that also occurred in the, the late 20s and early 30s 
uh, on both lakes was uh, uh, colored communities were proposed. Back then uh, they called African Americans colored. That was kind of the term used back in those days. And uh, a boxer by the name of Jack Johnson, an African American boxer who was a, a heavyweight champion, in fact, he thought about buying some property on Schaefer and, uh, and building a cottage there. And, uh, but there was some objection to it. So he never hadn't, he went and never hadn't did it. But then this Lafayette developer decided that he would buy some property on Lake Freeman and he would sell it to some African-Americans from Indianapolis. And he did, he sold some property to them. Well, that met some opposition because in the 1920s and 30s, there was a group called the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. And they actually had a, uh, they had a, a local following here in, in Monticello. And uh, they, they decided that they didn't want this, uh, this colored community in, uh, on Lake Freeman. So they actually burned out one of the a couple of the people that had cottages there. And they put up a sign and the sign said, white county is for white people Negroes not wanted. So um, needless to say, the, the colored community uh, failed on Lake Freeman and that was kind of the end of it. Um, uh, and that was unfortunate, those, but those were the, that's what uh, th things were during those days. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, Monticello actually began uh, to have large parties for uh, fishermen. Uh, they would, uh, starting in 1934, they would have bands and parades and different amusement things uh, like a festival. And so they made a big deal out of it. And they stores would open till midnight. And, uh, you know, there was just a lot of partying going on. And this went on for like uh, the next two decades up until 1954. And then uh, it kind of uh, just died out. I don't know exactly why, but it some, somewhat died out. And, uh, but then uh, they started having uh, festivals, not, not necessarily for the fishermen or for the fishing season, but they started having lake festivals. And, and of course that was to uh, promote the lakes and, and, uh, and that, that still continues today, except for uh, 2020, of course, because the Monticello festival was canceled this year, but uh, the festivals will continue in the future, I'm sure. Um, let me go back uh, a second to uh, Indiana Beach. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, it progressed to uh, 1940s, uh, and they had uh, big bands back then. I mean, the, you know, Spackman created this casino, although the, the first casino, a dance pavilion uh, that, he, that he built, uh, burned down the same day it was supposed to open, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, Spack, Earl Spackman was not, he was not phased. He was not undaunted. He went ahead and built another one and, uh, you know, just uh, went from there. Let me go, uh, let me get these slides up a little bit. This is a early picture of uh, Indiana Beach, by the way, probably from the second year, because you can see the second or third year, can you see the toboggan in the upper right, uh, the toboggan ride, and you can see the rowboats here. And uh, here's the KKK that I mentioned this was from uh, Hartford City though because every city kind of had a chapter here was the uh, a festival parade that uh, Indiana uh, that Monticello would have you see that city of Monticello and and uh, they would have large floats these businesses would create floats and say it says welcome to our city you know so they went did that <coughs> but then Indiana Beach um, oh it didn't like this photo for some reason that was a photo of actually of Tiny Hill and uh, Tiny Hill was uh, uh, not tiny, he was uh, rather large, but um, that was, let me see if we can get back to it, see if it'll show again for a second. No, it just says, so won't support this file format. I don't know why, but it's a JPEG. Anyways, and so uh, they, they created this casino, this dance pavilion, and they brought in large bands, uh, Tiny Hill, 
they had other real famous bands that uh, like, for instance, Louis Armstrong. Uh, but, uh, you know, Louis Armstrong, he's a, he was a African-American entertainer, but he was uh, national, had national fame and everything. And when he came in, I understand that I read somewhere recently that after his performance, he had a police escort outside, out, the, out, out of the county. So I guess they didn't want him hanging around. But And I had heard that the Spackmans, lots of times what they would do is they would they would house them right there at Indiana Beach because the hotels weren't allowing uh, African Americans to stay there. So uh, they they would actually put up some of the the bands, the uh, orchestra or the the uh, performers. Uh, and uh, then in the 1950s uh, they started bringing in rock and roll bands. So and and from the 50s and 60s they would have rock and roll bands. And then they would also have uh, these uh, orchestras. So they kind of trying to, to, to uh, be able to provide entertainment to the young and to the old as well. And they did that up until about 1970, early 1970s. And uh, unfortunately, um, they decided the entertainers decided they could go to bigger venues than Indiana Beach and Indiana Beach couldn't meet their price anymore. So uh, that kind of went away. Uh, Indiana Beach was really in an ideal location, Monticello an ideal location because it's between Indianapolis and Chicago. And so it would be like, okay, you know, back in those days that before the expressway and stuff, they were traveling you know, two lane roads, two lane, four lane roads. Uh, they didn't have a, a, the I-69 uh, like they have, or I-65 like they have today. So they would take uh, back roads, you might say, kind of like. And uh, so, you know, you travel for a couple hours and guess what, you're in Monticello. Uh, one thing Indiana Beach too is also bring in a lot of concessionaires. This photograph here, uh, I don't know if you recognize the people, but it's Pronto Pup. And Pronto Pup started like in the late 40s and they've been at the beach ever since, uh, handed down uh, you know, to uh, relatives and stuff. So uh, th those are the current owners right now. I think this photo was taken probably 10 years ago, but I think they're still running the place. And they brought in concessionaires and uh, probably one of the most famous ones other than Pronto Pup was the taco shop because that went on television. But um, the, uh, the Spackmans, as you might recall, sold the beach in 2008 to Morgan RV. And Morgan RV, uh, you know, let some of the concessions go. They uh, didn't, weren't that interested. And then when Apex bought, bought them out in 2016, Apex decided that, no, they didn't really want concessionaires. They only kept a couple concessionaires that was it and Prano Pup and, and Taco Shop was one of them but then uh, two years ago uh, Taco Shop left because they just weren't making the money that they uh, were making back in the old days so they went ahead and left but guess what the Taco Shop is back so if you want to go uh, of course they also have a Taco Shop same owner has a place in Monticello downtown Monticello so you can go there as well but you, you don't have to go to Indiana Beach to, uh, to enjoy the taco shop, but now you can go out to the taco, uh, taco shop at Indiana Beach. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's really kind of evolved and gone around, but uh, Indiana Beach is back. It was uh, sold, you know, it was actually closed in, in January. They closed it officially. And then a, uh, a Chicago developer by the name of Gene Staples went ahead and purchased it uh, uh, in, I believe it was April something, but uh, that's in the book. So the book covers Indiana Beach history all the way up until Gene Staples purchased it. So the book covers, uh, and, and it's kind of this short history of Indiana Beach. Uh, if you want the long history, you have to kind of go back to my other book that was uh, published in 2012 by uh, another publisher. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, resorts and RV parks. Uh, the book covers uh, the resorts and, and RV parks that uh, have been uh, in the area for a long time. Um, 
especially some of the resorts. Uh, let me uh, let me go fast forward a little bit. Here's some more uh, pictures of uh, Indiana Beach. Uh, as you might recall, um, you uh, had ski shows. Uh, they started in the 1950s and they lasted all the way until uh, till, uh, the 2000s. And then uh, they started bringing in other shows like a pirate show and things like that. In the uh, also in the 19, um, go back to this photograph here. This is what they originally called Paradise Island. It was uh, formed in 1954 when Lake Schaefer was dropped, and um, they went ahead and created this island. Uh, this had, this island had started before by Mayor O'Connor, but unfortunately, when they filled up the lake, um, it covered up what he had already. Put there, so it wasn't it wasn't high enough to begin with. But when they lowered the lake, that gave uh, the Spackmans the opportunity to create an island, and, and they brought in dirt, stone, and everything else to create this island. And and you can see this this photograph is from after the 1960s because the bridge in the in the left hand side of this photograph was built uh, in 1960 mid 1960s and created uh, what they call, what is now called South Parking. Um, the South Parking was actually a, a driving range for a while before the Spackmans purchased it and created parking instead of, <clears throat> instead of a uh, driving range. Uh, this photograph here, uh, you can see there was a, um, let's see, that's a, uh, well, you can see the miniature golf course at the end of the at the end of the island. Uh, unfortunately, that's not there anymore. Uh, they also put in a, a large uh, Ferris wheel, uh, and that's not in this photograph. So this this photograph is probably from probably the late '60s, early '70s. Uh, there is a go kart track there in the middle of the island, and you can probably see that. Uh, and, and then uh, some other rides are there as well. Um, and then this is more of a, a current photograph because uh, rides evolved on Indiana Beach. Whoops, do we want to go that fast? Go back here a second. Uh, amusement rides started really coming in in the 40s and concessionaires would bring them in. And then in, in the 50s, since they, they decided that they would drop the name Ideal Beach and make it call it Indiana Beach because I guess they didn't, the, the contract with uh, Ideal Furnace Company was up so they could name it something else if they wanted to. So Tom Spackman, Earl's son, decided uh, to rename it Indiana Beach, give it more of a, a regional flavor than, than just Ideal Beach. And uh, then, this, then they started bringing in uh, rides and then Finally, roller coasters were brought in uh, beginning in the 1970s. And you can see, uh, I think that's a Hoosier hurricane that we see in this particular photo, as well as the uh, large Ferris wheel that's there now. Uh, let me talk a little bit about resorts then. Uh, like I said, the uh, covers resorts. This one here is awful small photo that I'm looking at. I don't know, how how's it look on the other one there? <laughs> I don't know, but it looks awful small, but it's uh, it's uh, it's the White Point Hotel. And and it was it was a larger one of the resorts. Now, a lot of the resorts when they first came in, they were very small. They might have like four or five cottages and that was it, you know, or uh, and they didn't really have hotels except for the, the White Point Hotel here, but they, they were pretty small. Um, and then, uh, and, and, and really probably in the 1950s, there was probably, oh, as many as 40, 50 resorts. I mean, there was quite a few resorts in the 50s. And uh, I saw on a brochure there was like, like close to 50. And then, um, but in recent years, that those those a number of resorts have dwindled, but they've they're also larger. You know that is, uh, they might have more rooms nowadays, uh, but the the number of resorts has dwindled all the way down to like I think it was about a dozen when this year started, and uh, so the number of resorts has dwindled quite a bit over the year, unfortunately. 
RV parks, uh, they've been around for quite a few years. Um, Indiana Breach uh, brought theirs, and I think it was in 1960s when they started their uh, RV park. And, uh, and then there's a number of other ones. And, and the book uh, covers uh, the different RV parks that are, uh, and, and of course, whenever I, whenever I cover the resorts uh, like this, uh, I, I go ahead and give you the history, like this one here. Here's Roy Conrad Sportsman's Restaurant and Hotel. Uh, back uh, in the 30s, uh, this was built in the late late 20s, and there was also a golf course that went along with it, a nine-hole golf course. But um, Roy Conrad was a uh, uh, he was in politics, and uh, and like I said he created and he called it Conrad the Conrad, but uh, nowadays it's just called the Sportsman's Inn and it doesn't have ho any hotel rooms anymore. What they did was uh, they went upstairs and they created some, they created some large rooms for parties and things like that, but uh, no longer. I'd, it actually had another section built onto it uh, that is, has since gone away, but it had, uh, it had like, like moat, it was like a motel and has rooms off to the side there. If you're looking at this, it would have been off to the left. And uh, I don't know exactly when that went away, but it was uh, popular for a while, but then they decided to uh, get rid of them. And I think it's been replaced by a, a sand volleyball court or something like that. That's where the sand volleyball court is nowadays. So, um, you know, but that was not, here's one of the newest ones. The Alexander's Landing is, uh, used to be called Bayside Re Resort. I took this photograph last year. And so you could see, okay, it was called Bayside Resort. Now it's Alexander's Landing. So they had um, purchased it, put up this banner and, uh, and, and came under new ownership. And they went in there and, and did some renovations. And, and uh, I think they're, uh, with with Indiana Beach being uh, still open, uh, they probably had a, a good successful year because uh, this is located right off Indiana Beach Road. So right up, you know, we're talking a block away from Indiana Beach. <clears throat> so, of course, a lot of resorts relied on Indiana Beach traffic uh, for their resorts. And if it went for Indiana Beach, you wouldn't have all those resorts. So one kind of one thing created the other, uh, which was which was really nice. Um, so we'll go on from here. Okay, one thing uh, the book covers is, uh, another thing it covers is fishing, of course, because what do the lakes provide? Well, a lot of fishing. And here you can see uh, this photograph here is was taken, uh, it was earlier this year, I believe, I took this photograph. And it's, uh, I don't know if you don't, rec if you don't recognize the area, it's uh, below the uh, Norway Dam. And this, this guy was fishing off the side, which a lot of people do right there. And then, of course, you got this boat over there uh, fishing. And, uh, of course, you have to be kind of careful with uh, fishing around the dam because uh, uh, guess what happens when you get a lot of rain? They open up the dam and uh, creates a lot of... Uh, a water rushing out and, and uh, especially when it's a lot of rain. So you gotta be careful. And, and there's actually been some accidents right here at the, uh, at the uh, Norway Dam uh, below it. Uh, there was uh, a, a canoeist that was killed a couple of years ago. It's one of the ones I can think of. Uh, the book, the one thing the book does cover is it does cover a lot of the accidents and drownings unfortunately that have occurred on the lakes over the years. Um, and, and I, you know, I gathered that information from, from newspaper reports. Uh, there's been some really tragic ones. I don't know if you might remember there was, there was actually a baby that was, uh, was killed because it, it, uh, they ended up getting flown out of a boat, you know, and, and uh, they lost the baby. So uh, there's been some real unfortunate ones. Uh, there's been, one of the latest ones too was somebody was shocked uh, and died, you know, because of electrical problem uh, off of a, off of a pier. 
So, uh, you know, like I said, the book contains all that. Uh, one thing about fishing, there's always been a lot of contests because uh, it's got, oh, well, let's, we got all these fishermen here. Let's go ahead and create some competition. And uh, the Chamber of Commerce uh, would hold some. It would. Well, we got library announcement here. <laughs> that was unplanned. Um, the chamber held a contest, uh, newspaper, uh, the Herald Journal, they used to hold contests. And, uh, you know, and, and, and there's other organizations that would hold a fishing contest. So uh, fishing's always been very popular. And to, uh, to go along with that, um, of course, you have, uh, you have who sells the fish? Well, restaurants used to sell a lot of the local fish that was caught. Uh, I don't know if they do that nowadays so much, but uh, back in this, this is a postcard from called uh, Fisherman's Paradise. And the book contains the history of, of a lot of the restaurants that were created because of the lakes. They were located like uh, in Norway and uh, along uh, Lake Freeman and uh, Lake Schaefer. Uh, and, and so they kind of were, were created because of the lakes. And I've had the history of those on the, this particular one, Fisherman's Paradise, was built and, uh, in Norway. And uh, it was kind of like the uh, predecessor to what now is now Angler's Restaurant, uh, another restaurant that's located, of course, uh, in Norway is Riverside. And, and it specializes in, in fish as well. Um, like I said, a lot of restaurants do. Uh, for instance, like the uh, the Oakdale Dam. I think the the Oakdale Dam Inn. Uh, it's now under a new ownership, and but under the old ownership, uh, they had a sign. I think it was called uh, "Best Catfish by a Dam Site," you know, uh, which I thought was kind of a, a cute saying. But uh, I have the history of uh, of that restaurant in the book as well, uh, at Riverside and uh, Anglers and many other restaurants that have been in the area. Uh, fishing also uh, created uh, fish hatcheries uh, in the area. And one was located in Norway, and this is a, a picture of it. Um, and it's, as you can see, the dam up in the upper left-hand corner uh, is, the, is where the Norway dam is. So it's just kind of south, uh, south of the dam as, it, as the, uh, the river turns. And now what's located there, I would think is Riverside or, or at least, well, this is, this is the area, I think what they did was they created an area in which you can launch boats from, you know, uh, there's a, a boat launch there and that's uh, provided by uh, the lakes. I think Seflec is, provides that particular thing now, but that's what it looked like. And the hatcheries, hatcheries of course would, be where uh, they would would uh, raise fish, uh, and and then when they became uh, fingerlings, the size of your finger, then they would launch them out into the lakes. So uh, having hatcheries nearby was really convenient, and they would uh, they'll do uh, a lot of uh, sporting fish were created here in these hatcheries, uh, like uh, bass and things like that, and then they would be put out in into the lakes. And those were the kind of sporting fish that people like to uh, catch, uh, challenging, uh, challenging fish. Um, and of course there's uh, catfish and other fish that are in uh, the area. But this fat, this hatchery went away as well as the one in Springboro. There is a, there are a couple of hatcheries in the state though still. And, and uh, you know, once in a while we, they uh, provide fish to the lakes to uh, kind of resupply to make sure that the fishermen have uh, fish to fish. Um, one thing that's been around and the book covers is marinas. Uh, marinas started in the uh, late 20s on Lake Schaefer uh, and, and then uh, have, have gone ever since then. Uh, this particular marina, Tall Timbers, is on Lake Schaefer. And it started in uh, 1950. And then Tall Timbers created one on Lake Freeman. And uh, this, it's been moved around. And originally, uh, Tall Timbers on Lake Freeman was located where Roth Park 
was located. <clears throat> and then they created a place uh, in East Monticello until a new bridge was built. And then they had to, they had to demolish that place. That was the, uh, the state took it over and because they were building a new bridge and they went ahead and bought a marina further south in, in Lake, <clears throat> in Lake Freeman. And, uh, and they're there today. So Tall Timbers is really the, the largest marina, but the book covers other marinas that have been located on the particular lakes. Um, one thing uh, the book also covers is sightseeing cruises. Sightseeing cruises have been around for many years. Uh, the first one that started on Lake Schaefer was called the uh, Daddy Wahoo. And a guy by the name of Hugo Butler uh, went ahead and started this. He was a uh, kind of a famous concessionaire out in Indiana Beach. And this was one of the concessions that he went ahead and created. And this was, a, 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 I believe, a, a, a what was it? Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the boat. But anyways, um, he created this boat. And you can see it only fitted maybe maybe a dozen people or something like that. But he, he started this in 47 and would take people on cruises. And then Indiana Beach decided to come up with a larger boat and they came up with what they call the Schaefer Queen. And, and that was in the 1960s. And the Schaefer Queen uh, has been rebuilt a couple of times. And uh, the, the, so it's, and it's been going and it still goes these uh, today. They, they do cru cruises on a, a regular basis, on a daily basis. And I think it's part of your pass when you, uh, when you buy a pass at Indiana Beach. Um, on Lake Freeman, uh, the first cruise boat started in 1963. This is not it. This is a Madam Carol. But uh, Bill Luce Sr. started, uh, a, a, a built a boat uh, called the Robert E. Lee. And uh, that was his first cruise boat on Lake Freeman. Uh, when he had problems getting it started because there was an explosion during the building of the first of the Robert E. Lee. And it actually killed a couple of people. And that accident is detailed in the book. But then he was able to get it finished and in 1963 started it. And then it was so popular, he decided to build a larger one. You know, why not? So in 1976, he built the, the Madam Carol. And it could accommodate several hundred people and, uh, and dancing down below uh, with bands and, you know, a bar and everything like that. So. It was, and it, it was really successful. It was uh, a lot more popular in the earlier days, but, and they would have more cruises on, on a daily basis and on the weekends. But uh, now it's basically more of a weekend type cruise boat, um, <clears throat> but it's still popular. It, uh, Bill Luce uh, Sr. sold it, or the Luce family sold it uh, so, several years ago to a guy from Logan Sport, and then he turned around and sold it uh, last year um, to a couple other fellows from Lafayette, and they currently run the boat. Um, another thing that's been held on both lakes is uh, boat parades. Um, Lake Freeman was uh, actually had, did a boat parade from 1952 until 1978. And then it kind of died out. And then it was revived in 2005 by a guy by the name of Joe Carello and Steve Jones. They went ahead and created the Patriotic Boat Parade. And, uh, and it went, it's been going on ever since, except for this year, it was canceled. But another fellow went ahead and, and created a July 4th boat parade um, this year to, I guess, you know, basically replace it. Uh, he allowed military veterans on for free as well. But uh, he had, of course, there were limited in number of people that they could have because of the pandemic. Uh, so that's got a lot of history. And this one here shows the Madam Carol with a lot of boats behind it. Uh, Lake Schaefer has also had a chair of boat parades uh, starting in 1960. Uh, and they've been on and off ever since. 
um, the last uh, boat parades that they were having there on Lake Schaefer was called the Electric Boat Parade. At least that's the first name of it. And it was basically sponsored by Indiana Beach. And it was held in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, this trophy here shows one from 1966. And I believe this is the one that uh, the photo was uh, given to me by my neighbor, George Loy, who uh, had a boat in the parade. And uh, so a lot of people have enjoyed uh, the boat parades uh, on both lakes over the years. The book has uh, many other things into it. Um, bridges for one thing. Now, the one thing to it, now this bridge doesn't really go over the lake because, you know, some people, you might think Lake Freeman starts after the Norway Dam. Well, technically not. Uh, after the Norway Dan, it's, it goes back to the Tippecanoe River and is technically the T Tippecanoe River from, from the dam all the way until the Tioga Bridge, the old Tioga Bridge, which is no longer in use. But I decided to cover uh, some of the bridges that are either, uh, either on uh, Lake Schaefer or Lake Freeman or the river that is in between both of those lakes. And this one here shows the Washington Street Bridge uh, when it collapsed. Uh, fortunately, nobody was killed during the collapse of it, but they, uh, this was uh, in the late 40s, as I recall. And of course, then they had to build a new one. And what the people would do was uh, they actually built a, a temporary span and people had the choice of either walking across the railroad bridge, which you can see in the background, of this particular photograph, or they uh, could go along this other uh, smaller span uh, and they weren't, weren't allowed to drive cars. Although I understand somebody decided to drive across it with a Jeep one time. So, um, <laughs> but that information is all in the book about the, the different bridges that were there. The book contains a lot of uh, information about all the different organizations. I mentioned CEFLEC or the men's name CEFLEC and that's the uh, Schaefer Lakes Association. And uh, that I give the full history of CEFLEC in the book as well as many other different organizations that uh, have been involved in the lakes. Uh, another thing that uh, was uh, on the lake for along Lake Schaefer for a long time was the Lakeview Home. Um, it was first created back over a hundred years ago by the county. And it was basically, back then they called it a poor farm. That is uh, people that were poor, uh, they, it gave them a place to stay. Um, it, it also had, even had a small jail in it, which I thought was interesting. And there was actually a murder that was held there in uh, the 1920s. A murder was, um, uh, <clears throat> and and somebody was convicted of murdering somebody else. But uh, the county, about ten years ago, they decided, well, it's just too expensive to maintain, so we're going to go ahead and sell it. And they went ahead and auctioned it off, and a guy bought it. And um, but he he didn't do anything really with the home. He decided that that. Uh, I don't know, he, 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 I guess he bought it without a clear direction on what he was going to do with the home. So he didn't do anything with it. So then he turned around and sold it to a couple other guys, investors, and uh, they bought it. And they, they wanted to sell it. They wanted to sell the property and they weren't interested in the home. So as you can see, they demolished the home. This was several years ago. And so uh, the, uh, the property now, of course, doesn't have the home. It's just a blank piece of property. It's they were trying to auction it off last year and and or earlier this year and uh, didn't have any success with it. So it's it's for sale if you're interested. Uh, I think they want uh, a lot of money though for it. Um, the book also covers the different bait shops that are uh, in the area. Uh, one of the oldest ones was called the Blue Sea Bait Farm, and it was located in um, Norway. And as you can see, it, it sells there that what it has a listing of what they sell. But they also provided boats and cottages, and and I understand they built uh, or created roads to uh, cottages for you. So they did a lot of different 
things for you uh, for other than just selling bait. You know, they did it all. And there was quite a few and, and hotels back resorts, a lot of resorts would sell bait uh, back in the early days. Uh, but nowadays it's mostly, there's a couple bait shops left and, and I have the history of those in there in the book as well. And, and, uh, so I try to include everybody uh, in there as well as the older ones, but sometimes it's uh, information is hard to find. Um, the book, uh, I decided to go ahead and do a story about the old Monticello drive-in, uh, history of Monticello drive-in, which is now called Lakeshore drive-in. Uh, that's the, uh, the originally, uh, Monticello drive-in had one screen, as you can see here. And, um, then the current owner, Earl McLaughlin back in, I think it was 2002, he decided to build a second screen. So now the, uh, the Lakeshore drive-in has two screens. And uh, this year was, uh, you know, we, we didn't. I actually, I actually work part-time there on Friday and Saturday nights as a ticket taker. And we didn't know how it was going to go because of the pandemic, but uh, all the other theaters were closed. So it's kind of like, well, we're the only show in town, the only movie house in town. So people came out in droves and we've had a lot of people that first time, first timers. It's like, I've never been to a drive-in before and that's why I came. So, uh, you know, the drive-in has done really good in business, uh, mainly showing retro movies. Although I think uh, they, they do have a new movie out that's going to be there this weekend. Uh, it was there, I was there on last week as well. Uh, unfortunately, they had problems with it Saturday night, couldn't show it, but uh, it's on again uh, this weekend. And I think they're showing retro movies as well. So, um, and it, it's open until Labor Day and then it'll close up. Um, the one thing that uh, I wanted to tell you about, it's a, pretty much the end of my photographs. I don't think I have any more photographs. No, that's the end of my photographs. So I'll get rid of this for you. And um, <clears throat> so we stopped sharing that. Okay, yes. All right. Uh, the book does contain uh, many other inf uh, other information uh, about history around the lakes, including there used to be a marathon that went on for a couple of years around Lake Schaefer. There was uh, balloonists that uh, went for a couple of years in, in Lake Schaefer. Uh, it has sailing clubs that have been in Lake Schaefer, although I, I missed one. But we, you know, after the book came out, it was kind of interesting. Somebody told me about the Lake Freeman Ski Club. And I go, I didn't know about the Lake Freeman Ski Club. And so they told me about it. And I said, well, now I'll include it when I, when I revise it. Um, and they also told me some history about Ski Island. Now, Ski Island is mentioned in the book uh, because uh, there was uh, a prehistoric bones that were discovered by Ski Island. But I really don't mention, I don't really give the history of Ski Island. Uh, it, at one time, it was actually called Goat Island, and you can understand why it was called Goat Island, because there was a bunch of goats on it. I guess they were used to uh, trim the grass there, but uh, now it's called Ski Island. It has been for a long time, um, and that, that'll actually be in the, the revision to the book. Uh, the other thing that came up was somebody asked me, uh, why, you know, why was it, uh, all of a sudden it was called, uh, you know, it was called Schaefer Lake and Freeman Lake. And now it, then all of a sudden now it's, now it's, then it becomes Lake Schaefer and Lake Freeman. And I said, well, that's a good, good question. I don't know exactly when I've been doing research on that. And it looks like it's either in the late fifties or early sixties that the, the names kind of switched, uh, from the, the, the lake being, instead of being afterwards of being before so but you know it's one of those things that uh if i find out the the true definitive answer to that question i'll put it in the revision to the book um and that's when i run out of copies so by the way copies there are copies available at the white county historical society they're open from wednesday to friday from 10 a.m to 4 p.m uh or you can buy a copy from me um, for $15, uh, send it to Madden Publishing, 673 East 
Lakeside Drive, Monticello 47960. That's, I'll repeat that again, in case you didn't get it. 673 East Lakeside Drive, Monticello 47960. Um, and I will, if you live locally, I'll deliver it to you. There's no delivery charge. If it's, uh, if you live outside of Monticello and I have to ship it to you, it's an extra, it's an extra $5. Of course, there's a copy right here at, at the library, but I understand it's checked out right now. So you can't, you, you have to put your name on a waiting list, right? To, to get a copy of it. And, and that's fine. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that that's why the library buys my books too, because that way you can, you can check it out for free and not, not be charged anything for it, you know, but the revision, the, the revised book will come out. Oh, whenever I run out of copies and tell you the truth, I'm pretty getting close to running out of copies. I'm uh, copies are getting low and, and maybe by the end of this year, I'll have to, uh, get it revised and, and uh, reprinted and, and extra copies uh, made up for people that want it. But it's, it's been very popular. I've sold over a hundred copies. I'm really happy with, with the sales considering I didn't have any place to really sell it other than the historical side. And they didn't open until July after July 4th. So it was kind of like, you know, uh, but that's the way it goes with the uh, pandemic. I don't know. Do you have any uh, any questions or anything that came in on Facebook? Um, no, we have not had any um, questions or anything. Um, so yeah, like Bill said, um, we do have his book here so that you can borrow. Um, there's just been it's been out, <laughs> so I didn't even get it myself to have tonight um, to be able to talk about it. Um, we have several other of his. Um, books too that are available one he's been talking about the beach so we have this beach uh, indiana beach um, book too that's available um, it's just um, it's been interesting all the the information you've shared you know tonight with us um, and i know i've heard when talking about the beach i've heard you know about the previous um all the artists musicians that's come and you know it's amazing to hear about some of the bigger ones that actually came here in the past so um there's a lot of history there around these lakes period you know with what's been going on so um so thanks tonight for joining us thank you bill for being here and presenting. Um, like he said, he has his book available to purchase either at the White County Historical Society or you can purchase it from him. Um, if you do need that address again, we can um, post it onto our um, the comments section on here. Just, you know, give us a just mention you'd like the, the address and we can make sure to get it to you. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, make sure to like our channel, um, you know, even turn on the notification bell. That way, if we go live again, you'll be able to be notified right away. Um, and we will have some more upcoming virtual programs coming up. So um, follow us on Facebook and just keep track of what's going on. All right. Thank you.